It's Christmas morning here in Yokohama, and I'd like to welcome you to another adventure of Astrophotography Japan. So winter has arrived, and in this area of the country, that usually means low humidity and clear skies. So lots of opportunity for astrophotography. Last night, I did a little bit of imaging in my backyard, and I used this Samyang 14 millimeter lens here. It was the first time I've ever done some very wide field astrophotography. And so I'd like to tell you a little bit about my experiences with that. If that interests you, please stick around. Now, I don't own a DSLR camera, but for a while now I've been thinking about buying one. My personal preference is for Canon products. So in the consideration of wide field lenses for doing astrophotography, I wanted to buy a lens that would be compatible with Canon cameras. After doing a lot of research, I settled on this Samyang 14 millimeter lens, uh, as I mentioned earlier. It's a nice product, but I want to also do my own evaluation of it. Now, I only have CWO cameras, but fortunately, they sell this adapter here, which can connect to a full frame Canon lens to the M42 threads on the camera. It's also a filter drawer, and uh, that's an added bonus. This lens is quite heavy, as you might imagine. And so securing it to the camera and holding it in place uh, was something that I had to consider. This silver ring here is designed for the ZWO cameras and works but it's not very wide and a single ring actually i feel is not secure enough uh, i was worried about it sort of slipping or tilting during the imaging session so i purchased an additional one and attached both of them to this short uh, vixen uh, bar here which then of course can be put here on my uh, mount of course, an additional clamp at the top for a laser or something else is also good for attaching accessories. One of the things I don't like so much about this lens is this lens shield here. Of course, probably it's fine in the daytime, but at nighttime, it doesn't provide any additional protection against stray light. So I created a little bit of a homemade shading device here. And this is made from fabric that I purchased at a fabric store. It's fake leather, basically. On the inside is felt, and on the outside is this sort of fake leather. So on the inside, this is a very matte finish. And I cut it out in a fashion that I can attach it to the front of this lens. I have Velcro here to uh, attach it. And it has these sort of protruding three areas here of the fabric that hold on to the lens. I created this other kind of uh, strip here and by putting this over the top of those three protruding uh, areas, I can now wrap this around and again with Velcro, Velcro, hold it into place. So this actually works quite well. And it was very inexpensive to make. And I now have this shield here to protect it from stray light. And I used that last night as I was imaging vertically here in my backyard. Before we dive deep into astrophotography, 
I wanted to share with you some autumn images from the past few weeks here around my home in Yokohama. This year, the foliage colors were quite vivid, as you can clearly see. And of course, the annual autumn tree spiders called Joro spiders get bigger and bigger in the fall. They spin huge webs and only survive to the first freeze. These little monsters are incredibly colorful and look intimidating, but beautiful, if there is such a thing. Joro spiders are not poisonous, but may inflict a strong bite if they feel threatened. They belong to the genus Triconophila. This time of year, the winter season in the Tokyo-Yokohama metropolitan area is rather unique. This is the weather forecast on Christmas Day. There is a strange microenvironment here on the Kanto Plain region in eastern Japan. The mountains to the west trap the prevailing winds and cold air behind them and force nearly all the snow to drop in western Japan. We are often surrounded by clouds in every direction, but the skies remain clear around Tokyo. It seldom snows and seldom gets below freezing in the daytime. It is rather pleasant. I noticed this cloud formation in the sky in the evening time. It kind of looks a little ominous, especially on Christmas night, don't you think? Now, before any astrophotography session, Getting a good polar alignment is mandatory to get faithful tracking of the stars as they move across the nighttime sky. In my backyard, I generally use the ASI Air and All Sky Polar Alignment, but I suspect it will not work particularly well with a 14mm camera lens. So I decided to do polar alignment with my AT60 ED telescope at 288mm focal length. The photo on the right is a two minute exposure with no tracking, just for fun. At some time in the future, I intend to do a video entitled Seeking the Perfect Polar Alignment. Yeah, I know what you're thinking, not another polar alignment video. But I think many people rely too much on just the applications and data fed to them by the computer. How often do you actually check it? For me, I have to check and double check every time I attempt a polar alignment in my backyard. In fact, it is always a four-step procedure beginning with compass alignment and then all sky polar alignment. But for whatever reason, these two are not always enough in my tiny backyard. I always verify my alignment with a one or two minute exposure without guiding to see if there are any residual star trails after steps one and two. Almost always that is the case. And then I proceed to do a drift alignment by making systematic adjustments to both RA and latitude, each time taking a one minute photo and visually inspecting the impact of those adjustments until I zero in on a solid polar alignment where I see negligible star drift even after a one or two minute exposure with no guiding. And that is what I did here to get this image. I then checked it on another area of sky to verify once again that my alignment was good. Here you can see the star Sheraton, the second brightest star in the constellation of Aries. I saw nearly perfectly round stars after a two minute exposure with no guiding. Interestingly, now that I was absolutely certain of a good polar alignment, I thought it would be fun to check the data given by the ASI Air All Sky Polar Alignment Program. So I initiated an all sky alignment and checked the statistics for accuracy, expecting it to be very low in good numbers. But the program surprisingly told me I had an error of 1 degree and 13 minutes. Clearly that was wrong, so I repeated it again. And again I got 1 degree and 14 minutes error. It was wrong, but at least it was consistently wrong. That is why I never trust it. I always check my results and tweak it 
With a photo-based drift alignment procedure, I have gotten quite good at it and someday I will share that in a video. If I take that photograph and upload it to astrometry.net, I can get some information back telling me the size of the image. As you can see here, it says the field of view is about 2.25 degrees, which is 8,100 seconds of sky across the edge. Now, my ASI 533MC Pro camera has an array of pixels that span 3008 by 3008. That means each pixel is detecting the light from 2.69 arc seconds of sky. If my polar alignment is giving me nice round stars after two minutes exposure at this level of stringency, then any image train arrangement with a value of 2.69 arc seconds per pixel or higher should also be sufficiently tracked. So what about a camera lens? Well, here is a random area of sky photographed for two minutes with the same 533 MC Pro camera and using the Samyang 14mm lens. When plate solved in astrometry.net, it reports that the image covers 46.5 degrees of sky or 167,400 arc seconds across one edge. This means that 55.7 arc seconds of sky are illuminating one pixel when using the same camera. These conditions are extremely relaxed compared to the 2.69 arc seconds per pixel required for the AT60ED telescope. Hence, if we can get round stars with the telescope at 288 millimeter focal length, then we most certainly can get round stars with the Samyang lens at 14 millimeter focal length. In fact, we could probably do much longer exposures and still retain round stars with no trailing artifacts. So why did I buy the Samyang lens? Well, obviously there were several reasons. First, an f-stop of 2.8 is exceptionally fast, allowing it to quickly collect a lot of light. It also had a locking mechanism for the focus, similar in some respects to a telescope. Another feature was its weather sealing design, and finally, an affordable price. I calculated that the 14 millimeter focal length would give me a wide sampling of the sky when used with my 533 MC Pro camera, but not too big. The first thing that I wanted to do was test out the image quality at the fastest f-stop values. In the mechanical click-stop mode, it has seven f-stop values and halfway points between each. I took images at all f-stop values using two minute exposure times and a UV IR cut filter. Only four of those images are shown here. On this slide is a single image taken at f-stop 2.8. The box represents sections of the image that I significantly zoomed to examine the star images. I did the same for the first four f-stop settings and display those results all together here. I think you can clearly see cone-shaped patterns called a coma effect on the fastest f-stop in each of the corners. Even the round central stars have asymmetric light distribution inside their boundaries. The coma effect is significantly less at f-stop 4, transitioning into stretched star trails at the edges. In the center, the stars appear more circular, but still a bit oblong. At f-stop 5.6, the stars appear more round in the middle, but stretched star trails at the edges never really disappear, even up to f-stop 11 and 22. My conclusion was that f-stop 5.6 was probably the best option for speed and quality. So the remainder of my imaging was done at f5.6. Here is a single five minute exposure with no guiding, and you can clearly see that the tracking of the AM5 worked fine even at these prolonged exposures due to the low focal length and superior mount performance. This slide is interesting. It shows two central areas of that same five minute exposure image. The blue box is taken from the central area of the image. I expected the stars to be the most round here, but in fact they were slightly oblong. The roundest stars were seen in the red boxed area, 
slightly offset toward one side. This strange asymmetry may be a quality defect in the lens manufacturing. The effect is very subtle, but real. Personally, I do not consider this to be a big issue, but rather another example of you get what you pay for. By the time I finished all the polar alignment procedures and took all these other test images, Orion was now beginning to rise above the next house rooftop, becoming partially visible in the sky. So I proceeded to check my equipment for proper focus, install the Optolong L-Extreme filter, and get ready for imaging. As Orion approached the meridian, it was now completely visible above the rooftop as seen in this iPhone image. At this time it was now close to 11 p.m. and luckily the neighbors were dimming their lights and getting ready for bed. The night was beautiful and clear of clouds, but sky seeing conditions were actually quite terrible. On a scale of 1 to 5, they were at level 1 as reported by the Meteo Blue online weather forecast. Although it would have been horrible for planetary photography, the effect of bad seeing on wide field nebula imaging is unnoticeable. I was well prepared because I previously identified my desired field of view and plugged those central coordinates into the ASI Air go to function. In the selected field of view, Orion is in the lower corner and you can see my target central point indicated by the green laser. At this point, the target was still positioned east of the meridian and I started my imaging session. Unfortunately, I only managed to get about 35 subs with the Optolong L-Extreme, taking two minute exposure times. After stacking and stretching, that raw image is shown here on the left. There is a significant amount of nebulosity, but a very substantial light gradient was observed presumably coming from the Bortle 7 plus horizon in the local environment. For star field data, I took two minute images but used no filter and collected 13 subs. The stacked image is shown here on the right. So in total, my final image came from 96 minutes of total data. Unfortunately, the bottom stars of the constellation Orion do not stay above the rooftops for very long when being viewed from my backyard. For fun, I again downloaded the wide field image to astrometry.net, mostly to see the constellation patterns that were captured in my image. As reported before, this photo picked up almost 46 degrees of sky from Origa and Taurus down to Orion. And here is my final image after all the gradient extraction, background suppression, curves, denoise cleanup, and other post-editing magic. From only 70 minutes of dual narrowband nebula data in a Boidle Class 7 Plus zone, I think it looks pretty darn good. Captured in this one image are many famous nebulae, most of which I have previously imaged at higher focal lengths. They are all annotated here for your convenience. At the very top, we can clearly see the unique shape of the Flaming Star Nebula and the nearby Tadpole Nebula. And then working our way down the left-hand side are the Jellyfish, Monkey Head, Lowers Nebula, Christmas Tree Nebula, and Rosette Nebula. On the bottom right, we see Lambda Orionis, the Horsehead, and Orion Nebula, and Barnard's Loop. Interestingly, I can also see the tiny IC2162, but just barely, and three unknown nebulae visible on the bottom left. The three bottom left nebulae piqued my interest, and I tried to research them on various applications like Stellarium and Sky Safari Plus. However, there are no images at those locations depicted in any of the applications, yet they seem to be fairly bright as judged in my super wide field 14mm photo. So I thought it would be fun to image them a few days later. For this, I selected my Ascar FMA 135 Astrograph lens which should capture a segment roughly equivalent to the blue box shown here in the photo. This is what the imaging rig setup looks like, which I used on New Year's Eve. 
On this particular night, dew heaters were necessary, which is what are those green bands. I also elected to do some guiding, even though it probably was not particularly necessary. Also, I never really heard of the Lambda Orionis Nebula before, so the next night, on the evening of January 1st, I selected an interesting edge of Lambda Orionis to image with the same telescope rig setup. That field is highlighted in the yellow box. The Yaskar FMA-135 has an aperture of 30 millimeters and a focal length of 135 millimeters. I suspect its projected image circle is probably quite small, but then again, so is the sensor on my 533 MC Pro camera. Together they capture great images with no vignetting, even for this small aperture lens. This camera and lens combination is an outstanding match and I am extremely and constantly pleased with the performance. Here is the original image once again. Remember, it was taken at 14 millimeter focal length and shown on the left are the processed images taken with the 135 millimeter ASCAR FMA lens with their relative locations indicated by the colored boxes in the Samyang photo. Each of these ASCAR images were from approximately three hours of exposure time. Interestingly, that bottom left photo, when uploaded to astrometry.net, again failed to identify the three nebulae in the constellation of Monoceros. However, Telescopius, which besides Instagram is my preferred astro-sharing network, could identify them. They are SH2-280, 282, and 284. Based on this and other experience, I think that Telescopius has the richest database of annotated deep sky objects that includes many different object catalogs, even dark nebula. It seems to always give very detailed sky maps. Unfortunately, I could not find much descriptive information about these three obscure nebula on the internet, so I think they are not well studied and remain still somewhat mysterious. Here, I did the same with the image I took of the edge of the Lambda Orionis ring. It is located in the Orion constellation molecular cloud complex. It is massive in size when viewed from Earth. This is partially because it resides in the closest sector of the Milky Way to our solar system and is a site where high mass stars are being born. In this photo, I found there are some interesting rough micro shapes or textures along some of the edges of the nebula. I am not sure if that is reality or simply some artifact of the post-processing or the denoise program I used to smooth the image. But in my experience, it is not commonly seen in other of my images. So perhaps it is authentic detail. Anyhow, this huge cloud complex might be an interesting target for producing a larger tiled image someday, perhaps. Okay, now let me summarize some overall lessons I learned and information I gathered in researching this video. With regard to polar alignment, if you have the equipment on hand, it is best to perform your polar alignments with a higher focal length telescope or lens, and not with any super wide field lens like the Samyang 14mm you will certainly get better accuracy at higher focal lengths. Always check for star trails after a polar alignment. Never assume or trust that the polar alignment software accurately did its job. Guiding is not necessary with low focal length lenses and a decent mount. With specific regard to the Samyang 14mm wide field lens, a light block for this lens is a very good idea to reduce incidental light handmade items can work fine. The focus lock mechanism on the lens is very handy. I had to wrap the lens with a shade and a dew heater may be necessary as well. Those kind of wrappings on the focus ring may result in unintended torque and accidental loss of focus. Just beware. The f2.8 setting will give severe coma effects on stars at the edges. The f5.6 setting may be best for luminance and nebula imaging, although f4.0 might work well for nebulae since you cannot get any great nebular detail at this focal length anyways. 
This lens is a good value at $350 US, but expect artifacts, especially at the edges of the image. If you want a wide field lens with no artifacts, be prepared to pay substantially more and seek advice elsewhere. I am certainly no expert. With regard to wide field imaging under city skies, like the Bordel Class 7 Plus skies I have here in Yokohama, it is difficult. You will get dramatic background light gradients from the horizon. Any moon will dramatically ruin all attempts at nebula imaging. It has to be a moonless night. I also found that to capture a good starry background for separately processed nebula images, it is necessary to take quite long luminance exposures. I tried several filters, but ultimately did not use any for the 14 millimeter wide field photo that I displayed in this video. My luminance photos were also equally as long as the nebula exposures at two minutes each. The manual of the 533 MC Pro camera says it has an AR window glass, which I think stands for anti-reflective coating. To my knowledge, this sensor glass cover does not effectively block UV or IR light, and hence, without a filter, it will allow the capture of maximum light from the many tiny stars visible at this low focal length. And last but not least, I limited my exposures to only two minutes, even though I showed that a five minute exposure also worked fine with no star trails. The reason that I did this was to minimize interference by airplanes and clouds. With such a wide field of view, you are highly susceptible to accidentally capturing something in the skies above. Longer exposures than two minutes give incrementally better results, but the trade-off is risk. With longer exposures, how many frames are you willing to throw away, and is it worth it? Here, once again, for your viewing pleasure, are the three images I took in the southern skies of Yokohama. At 14 millimeter focal length and 46.5 degrees of sky on the right, I guess I would call this super wide field. The Sam Yang lens provided this image and captured nearly a dozen visible deep sky objects. It was also surprising and fun for me to identify particular nebulae that I never even knew existed and then explore them further. For example, the two images on the left are just such deep sky objects. These two were taken with my Ascar FMA astrograph lens at 135 millimeter focal length. At 4.5 degrees of sky, this focal length is also considered to be wide field by most imagers, including myself. Frankly, there are more regions of sky in the Sam Yang image that I also now want to explore more deeply with my Ascar astrograph lens. And finally, I am really excited to take this Sam Yang 14 millimeter lens out to a dark sky region to see what it can do. Later in the summertime, I look forward to pointing it toward the Milky Way to capture the majesty of our galaxy when viewed from within. I get a feeling this will be another new challenge and learning experience for me in astrophotography. So stay tuned for that. Minasan, akemashite o meitoto gozaimasu. It's January 1st. Happy New Year. You know, Christmas in Japan is not a national holiday. It's more of a commercial event for children and families. But New Year's, almost everybody gets the entire week off from work to stay at home and to partake in various Japanese traditions like the special foods eaten on New Year's Day called Osechi Ryori, shown here, is the feast that my wife prepared for us for breakfast on New Year's Day. Composed of a lot of different kinds of finger foods and different shapes and colors and tastes, each one actually represents a little different meaning for good luck in the coming year. Another thing that is a tradition is to take a walk to a local temple or a shrine, like I'm doing right now, to basically say thank you for the previous year and to pray for the year ahead. The weather here in Tokyo, Yokohama area is generally very mild during this time of year. It seldom gets below freezing. So for a buffalo boy like me, it's wonderful and it means lots of imaging time. 
You know, the reason I make these videos is because every time I go out for a new imaging session, I learn something. I either encounter a new problem that I need to fix, or I have an idea, or I'll try something new. And I do these videos basically to chronicle that and to share it with you. Hopefully you get some entertainment out of it and, and possibly uh, learn something. And of course, the other reason is because I want to share a little bit of Japan culture and history and sites with you. Uh, so thank you for joining me in 2022 for Astrophotography Japan, and I hope to be able to make a lot more videos in the future. In the meantime, I'd like to wish you all a very happy new year. Thanks again for joining me for another episode of Astrophotography Japan. My name is Paul Cheesegel, and I am an astrophotographer.